It used to be a commonly, commonly held view among farmers that farmers were only appreciated when there was a war. I don't know how many times I've heard that. You know, where suddenly, when there's no food being shipped in from abroad, farmers have to produce more, dig for victory, all that sort of stuff. Farmers suddenly become important. When there's no sort of, uh, we're not having a sort of Second World War or uh, Third World War, farmers re regard themselves as being not valued and not important. Well, I think for the first time since the end of the Second World War, farmers suddenly have become important. The production of food has become important. And so positioning this now in the world that we live in, I think is a very, very interesting and, and very different place to the one we've been in for the last 40 years. Uh, food security has uh, become uh, critically important. When commodity prices rise and we have deserts in different parts of the world and there's not quite enough to go around, suddenly having a secure supply of food uh, has become a critical issue. So we have these big global challenges and I think it's important uh, in, uh, in looking at the challenges we face today at a local level in positioning what we're doing against the background of what's happening globally and nationally. Uh, we have big global challenges, population growth, we all heard the statistics, forecast to be 9 billion by 2050. Uh, as you said, Lucy, we've got uh, still almost a billion people uh, under malnourished. Uh, but <clears throat> as uh, living standards rise, demand rises, the <clears throat> different types of food are required, so the diets are changing and uh, consumption is increasing. And of course we have... Uh, the impact of global warming. Whether you believe in climate change or not, uh, my wife doesn't, uh, but then she thinks that, uh, that the man going to the moon was all created in some sort of studio in California. Um, so uh, we are seeing the impact of, of climate change and global warming having a, a distorting effect on the production of food. Uh, we're seeing more weather volatility and we're seeing increased desertification. Uh, so the land mass that is available globally for producing food potentially is declining uh, and yet the population is increasing. Uh, we've also got the impact of not just food security but energy security. Uh, you touched on, on oil. Um, the whole, uh, uh, our ability to generate renewable sources of energy will impact on land use as well, so the competing pressures on land use for both food and fuel and fibre, energy generally, is going to have a, uh, and is having, uh, some impact on, on food prices and food availability. So these are big, challenging sustainability issues that we are uh, having to wrestle with. And, and at the same time, try and do it by pr producing less, uh, by, by uh, using less. So uh, with uh, finite resources available and potential uh, degradation of soils, uh, how can we produce more food to feed more people by using less, less chemicals, less nitrates, less, less phosphates, uh, less pharmaceutical products, etc. Scientists are wrestling with these challenges and uh, I'm quite involved in various, with various bodies who are uh, working on research programs uh, on this whole subject of sustainability. I chair a steering group called the Centre of Excellence for UK Farming and we're trying there to bring together uh, all scientific work that's been carried out which might impact on uh, our knowledge. Uh, and the tools that we might have available to produce food more sustainably in future. So how do we, how do we wrestle with these competing, often competing demands uh, of uh, in, increasing and improving our biodiversity, our habitats, uh, our ecosystems? Uh, how do we uh, uh, use less nitrates? How do we uh, conserve water and use water more efficiently? Uh, and generally reduce our input, and how we're going to trade off some of these competing issues which all impact on uh, sustainability generally. So we're wrestling, we're all wrestling with this, and we need to increase our knowledge. When people say to me, give me a definition of a sustainable farm, 
Uh, and my answer is, well, is that last year or this year or next year that you want the definition? Because the target is moving all the time as our knowledge becomes available on uh, what we might interpret as uh, the meaning of sustainability. Now, government has been, in my view, slow to sort of recognize uh, the impact of these global changes. Last government produced lots of reports. Uh, there was mine, the one you referred to, uh, Joe, and I brought a copy along because uh, it just helps to refresh my memory that I did write something 10 years ago. And uh, there are one or two sad people that still have it, and even sadder people who have it on the bedside cabinets and refer to it from <laughs> time to time when they can't fall asleep at night. Uh, but we did write in here, we believe that one of the greatest opportunities for farmers to add value and retain a bigger slice of retail price is to build on the public's enthusiasm for locally produced food or food with a clear regional provenance. Increasing the market for such food would have benefits for farmer and consumer alike. And that was 10 years ago. Uh, so there was that report. Uh, we, then, uh, we then had the Cabinet Committee report on food. We had the 2020 vision document. We've had John Bennington's foresight uh, report, which talks about the perfect storm. And, uh, and Tim Lang is still convinced, and he's with some justification, uh, that we don't have a meaningful food policy. So uh, we have moved uh, into a period of austerity, which has resulted in significant cuts to budgets, as you know, public expenditures being cut, and some of the resources that we had available uh, in the previous administration are no longer available today. So we have to try and address this whole issue of sustainability and producing local and regional food against the background of not having the resources that we had two or three years ago. Uh, now, I was, when I was responsible for the implementation of the sustainable, sustainable farm and food policy, we had uh, one northeast, we had a uh, group of people up here who were responsible for delivering the sustainable farm and food policy, uh, we were working with uh, the local food groups. Uh, we had food from Britain with some resource to assist. And, of course, all of that has changed. Um, and here in the northeast, uh, the uh, one northeast was uh, concerned about the importance of regional food and uh, what it can contribute to the regional economy. So, of course, they, they commissioned uh, some work to be done uh, went out to tender, and as some of you will know, uh, a consortium, including the Thumbrin Lada, was successful in uh, bidding for that tender. Uh, that uh, tender and what it was achieving was reviewed after a couple of years, and I was um, invited to chair a steering group to look at uh, what was being done, what needed to be done, uh, whether the policy needed refreshing, whether its implementation was going as well as it could. And I was then uh, chaired this uh, steering group which took it forward after that for about 18 months or so. That uh, funding ended last year. Uh, but hopefully in the region, as a consequence of that work, we've at least established a platform on which to build a stronger regional food economy. Is food and the production of food important to the Northeast region? Well, food is important to every region, so it must be important to the Northeast region. However, as a percentage of our regional economy, we're not doing as well as we could. Uh, the food sector in the Northeast, if we include uh, primary production manufacturing, accounts for about over 50,000 people employed in food one way or another. Uh, that's got to be an important uh, con contributor uh, to the economy here in the Northeast. It represents under 5% of uh, employment uh, and under 5% of, of GVA, uh, of gross value added product, the output of the region. But any, uh, any sector that represents 5% of a region's output is important. So it is important. However, we're not 
uh, achieving as much as we could, and that was one of the challenges we faced when I chaired the Taste Northeast Strategic Board. Uh, we, uh, we export out of our region about 70% of our primary production. So that includes meat and, and uh, grain and the whole uh, range of products we produce in the Northeast. So we export 70% out of the region, uh, and then we import 70% of our protest processed products back into the region. And that seems to be uh, a bit of an anomaly, and rather mad. Uh, so it's one of the, the uh, big challenges we continue to face in the region here. How can we increase the added value opportunities within this region of our, ours? How can we capture some of that value? How can we increase our capacity for processing and uh, manufacturing so that we are less reliant on uh, that large volume of imported processed products? One of the reasons behind this, of course, is that we have very few large uh, processing plants servicing supermarkets based here in the Northeast. Many of those large processing plants are outside of the region, so our large retail sector is being serviced from outside the region for a large proportion of the food that's sold through those large retail outlets. Now, that, one of the ways, of course, we can address this challenge is by increasing the proportion of local and regional food that's grown and processed and marketed within the region itself. So the challenge of the issues we're facing today within Durham and the food strategy is absolutely critical to the economy of the region. So uh, we've got lots and lots of issues that we need to tackle. And as you said, uh, Lucy, this is a very complex subject. Um, there is encouragement, however. The demand for local and regional food, despite the pressure on household incomes, is still uh, increasing. Obviously, it's slowed down. It's not uh, as enthusiastic as it was. But between 2005 and 2010, demand for local and regional food in the region doubled in those five years. Since then, it's slowed a bit. But uh, there is increasing interest. And when uh, when uh, household uh, expenditure uh, begins to return to normal, whenever that might be, we can see, I think, opportunities arising again. And we just have to also remind ourselves that um, there are lots of um, people who are part of the post-war baby boom like me around who've got time on their hands and their spendable income is not as affected by the austerity measures and the pressure on household budgets as those who are in full-time work with families and households with families. So there are still lots of people who are interested in local and regional food and shopping around and having a great food experience. There are also uh, significant opportunities in the public sector one of, the, one of the areas that frustrated me a lot when I was chairing the Sustainable Farm and Food Strategy was the lack of progress in supplying local food into uh, the public sector itself. Uh, I've spent a lot of time over the years working uh, uh, at a national level, uh, trying to encourage schools and hospitals, public sector generally, prisons, uh, I used to get into serious trouble for saying at least the prison should supply homegrown food because they're a captive audience. Well, that didn't go down too well. Um, <laughs> but it's, it is important that we try and exploit where we can opportunities in the public sector for local and regional food. And we've got some great models and examples of where success, success has been achieved. Price and budgets will always be a challenge in the public sector but innovative ways of, it, of, of working around those constraints have been demonstrated in other, in other areas and in this area too, and we can make progress in that area. Uh, we also need to bear in mind that the hospitality sector uh, is important. Tourism is critically important. And as a region, uh, we are seeing increases year on year in people, or we have been, uh, people visiting our region, 
And uh, as colleagues know who were involved in uh, the Taste Northeast strategy, it has been uh, one of my uh, challenges, personal targets, to try and bring food and tourism together. Uh, when people visit our region, uh, they don't just want to see all the wonderful historic places we've got and enjoy the landscape. Uh, they need to enjoy the food that we produce here and have a great culinary experience when they're enjoying the cultural experiences. To bring culinary issues and culture together uh, within the tourism sector and food and hospitality, I think, is really, really important. And we've not done enough in the past to do that. Now, let me just uh, conclude by uh, uh, asking what I think is required in order to drive this agenda forward. Well, we must um, utilise whatever financial resources there are available within the region to assist us in our objectives, because uh, funding is difficult. And so working with, with the LEPs, if we can, convincing them of the importance of the food sector within the regional economy. Uh, and uh, there is a bid from the North East LEP for uh, Rural Growth Fund, uh, which, which hopefully will be helpful. But wherever there are public uh, funds available, we need to make sure that we are accessing them. And we're working with others in partnership to access whatever funds there are. Rural development funding itself is still available to assist uh, in uh, encouraging uh, well-designed uh, uh, businesses that uh, uh, could well be linked to food production and will assist in growing the rural economy. Uh, I'm very keen that uh, we all work together. Now, there is a balance here between um, celebrating diversity and uh, local identity of food. And we must do that. And, uh, this initiative we're uh, launching today is about that, about celebrating the diversity we've got within our region and uh, the identity that we have within an area like Durham and unlocking the potential both in terms of production and consumption and, and the market demand for a, a diverse range of food products from within the region and working together to ensure that we are not overlapping in the work we're doing, and that we're not uh, reinventing wheels, uh, that, that uh, we're not duplicating resources at a time when resources are very thin on the ground. So um, we need, with this initiative, to work together with others. Um, Taste Northeast has now been reinvented uh, with a new management team in place. They have a regional responsibility and they're there to assist and help businesses develop, whatever that means for each individual business, uh, to encourage training uh, within businesses, because sadly one of the characteristics of our region is that we fall down very badly in terms of our training skills and needs, and uh, we need to access support wherever we can to assist and improve the skills base within our region, and uh, Taste Northeast are very happy to help companies to do that. This is not about uh, creating silos. It's not about uh, jealously, jealously guarding a particular regional position. It's about ensuring that we maximize the local food opportunities together and that as a whole, we grow the market here in the Northeast for local and regional food. And uh, we develop as a consequence, uh, not just sustainable food from an, from an environmental point of view, which clearly is critically important, but it is sustaining rural businesses and contributing to the economy of our rural areas as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.